bonds for Napoleon and his army and his supplies and etc. etc. And Nathan, who was in London, did exactly the same for Wellington. So, you're well ahead of me. So, at the end of the Napoleon Wars, the family, by the French and the English side of the family, had made quite a bit of money. So, it was after the Napoleonic Wars that the family decided they needed to diversify. What were they going to do with this money? And so they decided there were two areas that they concentrated on in the main. One was railways and the other vineyards. So the area that we're actually going to talk about is the, uh, the Dordogne and around um, the Bordeaux. Has anybody been to that area, southwest France? Excellent, lovely. Watered by the Gironde River, which is 60 miles long approximately. Um, it's also an area where the Romans introduced <coughs> viticulture um, to that area way back. And we know from records dating back to the 12th, 13th century, there were regular consignments of claret being sent across from France to England. Uh, we also know people like Louis XV and his amorous dinners à deux, either Madame de Pompadour or Madame de Valley, would have claret from this particular wine growing area. So names such as um, Lafitte, Entre de Mer, saint Emilion, or Bedoc, Margot were already established vineyards in this particular area. Um, and we also know that, for example, the word um, claret comes from the Latin word clarus, meaning, root, uh, meaning clear. And we know also mouton, as you probably, those who've got a smattering of French probably know it as the word for ram, but it's also an old French word for hill, because again, the area that we're talking about had lots of hills. And I also will add on that Lafitte also, old French word for hill. So we're talking about this area that's got lots and lots of ups and downs and already has a smattering of vineyards there. And in 1834, the Lafitte vineyard came on the market. James, who was in Paris, heading up the Paris branch of the Rothschild Bank, was known and renowned for always buying the best. And um, he thought, well, you know, I have a wonderful art collection I'm going to put in a bid for the Lafitte vineyard. To his annoyance, he wasn't successful. We fast forward 17 years, and another vineyard, the other side of the hill, two Lafitte, comes on the market by the name of uh, Rain Mouton. And Nathan in the London branch decides, oh, I think I'd quite like to have a vineyard. So he puts in a, a bid, and he is successful. As you can imagine, James was not particularly impressed. Um, two years later, in 1855, the French government recognises that they now have quite a few vineyards in this area, and they have no way of accrediting the quality of the wine. And so they introduce what we would now know as Appellation Contrôlée. And um, a Lafitte, as I mentioned, saint emilion entre le mer or Grayon, Margot, were already established wines. So Nathan thought, well, I might as well submit my wine, and hopefully, like the others, it will come out as a premier cru. You probably know what I'm going to say next, because unfortunately, it didn't. It came out at the top of the Dusian class, but that wasn't good enough for Nathan. He was a little bit miffed, a bit like James might have been a few years earlier. So he took an old French saying, and he amended it to reflect how he felt. And the saying goes, I'll do it in English rather than boring you with my French accent, but anyway, the saying goes, first I cannot be, second I do not wish to be, mouton I am. We'll come back to this saying in due course. Um, so this is, as I say, in 1855. Then we fast forward to 1868, some 34 years after Lafitte first came on the market and James put in an offer for the vineyard. And again, Lafitte comes on the market. James is determined that at all costs, he is going to buy the Fleet Vineyard, which he does. He is successful, and he gets, buys the vineyard. He pays three times the going rate to buy it, and we're talking lots of noughts. Within six months, he died. Oh. Yes. Now, he had four sons. And if you remember, I mentioned at the beginning that only sons were um, able to be involved in the running of the business. So of the four sons, Solomon does not inherit a quarter share. The other three brothers have a third each. Why do you think Solomon wasn't able to have 
shares in Vineyard. I'm very mean to do this to you on a Sunday afternoon. It was just Well, that's a very good point, but it wasn't. Oh. <laughs> I was a good point. No, it's because Solomon had two daughters. And the concern was that if the daughters subsequently married, outside of the family, they would have t been taken the shares out of the Rothschild family, which they didn't want to do. So he wasn't able to have a share. I guess he must have been recompensed in some other way, but he didn't have a third share of the vineyard. And it's actually from the French side of the family that uh, the current Lord Rothschild actually has a sixth inheritance share of uh, Lafitte. Um, and Lafitte has continued to go from strength to strength. And if you are if you've had a look at the video or are going to look at it afterwards, you'll see that now Baron Eve uh, heads up the vineyard there and it's still very, very um, successful and is still a premier crew. So we're going to concentrate on the Brain Mouton um, vineyard that um, Nathan purchased in 1853. Um, the first thing he does is to change the name from Brain Mouton to Mouton Rothschild. Um, and the vineyard continues to sort of, you know, make makes some very good in rows. It's still, don't forget, a dozium classic. It's not a premier clue. Um, and then we come to 1922, when, again, uh, a young French gentleman, Baron Philippe, from the French side of the family, wakes up on his 21st birthday to discover <coughs> he has inherited the Mouton Rothschild vineyard. Now, he's only a young man. He's 21. He likes, you know, wine, women, and song, fast cars, and all the rest of it. And somebody is saying, well, here's a vineyard. Now, at the time, the vineyard needed quite a bit of money spent on it, needed quite a bit of work. And he was a little <coughs> underwhelmed as to whether or not he really wanted the responsibility, but he enjoyed the challenge. So he said, yeah, that's fine. Thank you. I shall look forward to this. So one of the first things he did was to build this huge warehouse or um, barn. It's called the Grand Chai, which actually had capacity for a 1,000 barrels of wine. Because up until that stage, what would happen after the um, white vines had, and grapes had been picked, trampled down into liquid form, it was then put into casks and then taken to a local village, town, where it was bottled and labelled. And Baron Philippe thought, hey, well, there's a potential loophole here. I could be losing a, um, a cask or a barrel. Oh, look, it's fallen on the floor, sir. Um, mm -hmm. And yes, possible shrinkage. So he decided if he, if he actually built um, a warehouse to keep all the, ca the casks in, he would actually bring in-house the bottling and the labelling. So he was the architect of what we would call chateau bottling. So the first year that um, he had the Grand Chai, which was 1924, he decided to ask a young uh, graphic designer at the time, the name John Carlo, to design a label. I'll, sh I'll let you have a look. And he, um, I'll pass it around in a moment. He designed this very modern cubist um, design which became very iconic. It's got the ram's head, the five arrows, uh, and the wine, um, and has become very successful. And I'll just let you just take that round and show it around to everybody. So this was in, as I say, this is in 1924. So the vineyard continues to do quite well. And then in 1933, um, Baron Philippe decides that although his wine is still in the Ophidian crew, it's probably still quite expensive for the everyday man in the street. So what he decides to do is to introduce a slightly lesser wine, uh, which he calls Mouton Cabet, a son of Mouton, which you can buy in the wine shop here. Um, and it's still going very strong. It's like a bread and butter line. It's good quality wine for um, you know, everyday, everyday drinking, and it's, it's done very well. Um, and then we come to the Second World War. During the Second World War, this particular part of France was not bombed or strafed in any way, because the Germans liked their wine too, um, and they obviously were occupying France, they had a vested interest, so it remained unscathed. And at the end of the Second World War, again, Marlon Philippe thought this was another opportunity to perhaps celebrate the, the end of the war, and asked another young um, poster designer by the name of Philippe Julien to design um, another label. Unfortunately, I don't have it on that card. Um, but it has the famous uh, Winston Churchill V for Victory sign on it, and again, is, is quite well known. Um, and sales did very well. And it was at this point, and I came to a certain extent, it was the relief that the war was over, etc., etc. <laughs> but I think it also, again, provided another marketing opportunity. 
and Val Philippe was pretty good at picking up on this sort of thing. So he then decided, well, I've got, some, I know some friends of mine who are artists, perhaps they'd like to design some, some wine labels. So he asked people like um, Darnay, Chagall, Picasso, um, and Kodinsky, another well-known artist, um, to design labels. And every year since 1946, an, indi an individual wine label has been designed, and you'll see the display on the wall behind you. If you go into the wine shop, you'll actually see there is a huge wall chart that you can look at. You can also go online at www.rothschildwines.com and you should be able to see all the labels um, that are there. Um, so, as I say, it's, it's become quite a thing. And in fact, in 2004, Prince Charles also designed a wine label. It is on display, but unfortunately, because of Christmas decorations, it's in the kitchen corridor, you can't actually see it at the moment, but it, but it is there. Um, so, as I say, year after year, uh, labels have been designed, and that continues. Um, we then have, as I say, so this was at the end of the Second World War, and we then fast forward to 1973. By which point there are lots and lots of vineyards in the um, southwest area, southwest area of France. And again, the French government realised that they haven't done this in a, a stock take for quite some considerable time, and they undertake to do another accreditation. And the good news is this time round that, um, in fact, Mouton Rothschild did actually come out as a premier crew. Hooray, hooray, hooray! 118 years after the.